All right, hello, this is Malorian. We're going to try doing another little Malorian live thing here. This is actually the second take of this because we tried this a few weeks ago with the Sustainable Center, and for whatever reason, probably because I wasn't on you know, Google Chrome, it didn't work and it was all lost. So for those watching, as soon as you can, let us know if you can see this or not. But to start this off, you know, uh, Anthony, do you want to int introduce yourself and your channel and all that stuff? Sure. So my name is Anthony. I'm from the uh, Sustainable Center. Center. I run a little uh, tiny channel over in the Northeast. Uh, mainly focused on fantasy. I have some 40k, and I also follow Flames of War uh, and Infinity. And like Malory, I'm getting ready to go to Brawler's Bash uh, in less than two weeks. I can't believe it's uh, already here, and I'm so far behind. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mean like you still have a lot of painting to do? Or are you? Do you still have your your army not worked out yet? Are you still playing with that? I'm not. 95% lockdown. Uh, you know, Friday we're due for list, so it's going to have to be locked down then. But uh, yeah, I fa had that one terrible game against Empire, and it just kind of, I was like this close to feeling like really confident about it, and then mm -hmm. I lost a thousand points before I moved, and I wasn't so confident anymore. So. Yeah, that tends to change things. It seems like so far both of us, uh, our practice games aren't going so well, so not a very good omen so far, <laughs> that's for sure. Well, we'll meet each other on the bottom tables and drink around game three. We'll just do shots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that works for me. Uh, one of the things I thought would be, I mean, of course, we already talked about a bunch of stuff last time, but I thought something to talk about here is you had the one video coming out talking about how you're getting kind of uh, disheartened with your army and all this stuff. Just wondering, has that changed? Or are you still a little bit disappointed with the way the army's playing out? Well... One of the things I noticed is Warriors of Chaos doesn't necessarily match my play style. I like dependably crappy stuff, but I play these elite armies like Bretonian Warriors, and that's not what you get. You get really hard, tough guys with good stat lines, but there's not a lot of stackable buffs like Empire. There's not the unbreakable of, of Undead. So I've just started to embrace the go harder, go home warrior mentality that we're pure aggression. we got to get into close combat as quickly as possible. And um, since I've embraced that, I've kind of just accepted that we're going to have a couple bad games. And I think that's why when I started with Orcs and Goblins last year, uh, I didn't have a good experience because I didn't embrace the orky randomness and uh, just the, the play style of the army. So I, I feel like I've come full circle now, and I've just accepted what the Warriors are. And if I get the close combat, I might win. And if I don't, I'm probably going to lose. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I was just thinking about it, maybe want to run by you, see what you thought, because I heard that you had a whole bunch of warriors already painted off. I think you said like 120 you already have. And one of the things I was thinking about is, how about running Warriors of Chaos is almost like the anti-meta, so that right now, of course, the best way to make the list is with, you know, say like the Demon Prince and the Chimeras and all this thing, but of course, because that's so good, that's what everyone's going to be gearing to counter with all the cannons and stuff. So what if you didn't take all the monsters and you actually took a whole bunch of warriors, you know, a whole bunch of dogs in front to kind of clear things away? Do you think that actually would have yeah, like a viable strategy? I think it would be good at 2,000 to 2,500 points. I think at 3,000 warriors don't scale as well because they're so tremendously expensive. At 500 points, uh, for orcs and goblins, you bring the whole artillery battery. You, that's where all your extra 500 points go. For warriors, you can't even get like a block of 30 guys. Um, you, you, the Demon Prince costs 500 points alone. I mean, so the army is very expensive. I think it would work. I have about 96 warriors, I think, but they're all differently equipped. So I just can't run a bunch of halberd wielding guys. I've got two hand weapon guys. I've got halberd guys. I've got hand weapon shield guys. Also, I found is they kind of get in the way of each other. You're running six or seven wide. If one gets behind the other, it's really bad. It's like double pawns on a file. Um, so I, I think it's a lot of fun, but then you want to take things like the War Shrine because you want to be playing with the champion kind of games, and uh, obviously, you know, wherever your level 4 is, that's that's the block they're going to go after, and I think once they get one of your blocks, it's like 500 something points, and they can just kind of back up and play the defensive game, and bottom line is it's, it's cheaper to shoot warriors to death than it is to try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. War machines are very good and very powerful, magic's very good and very powerful, and um, I, I think you can counter it with less points than I actually can put on the table. So, Okay, because I mean, the way that I was kind of thinking of it through my mind is that, I mean, if you took those big things out, like you said, the Demon Prince being 500 points, blah, 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 all of a sudden, instead of taking a small unit of, say, 18 warriors, you can start going for the horde or whatever you want, and I mean, you can have some shooting against you, but by the time you get there, it just won't be enough. You're just going to demolish whatever you fight. Uh, of course, they'll be trying to throw chaff in your way, but you could be clearing your way with your own blocks and stuff. But I mean, a horde of warriors. I mean, at the start of eight, there's a guy here I played against, and that's what he loved to do. Is he ran 
two hordes of warriors and then hordes of marauders on the outside. That was with the older book, of course. But man, I gotta say, like fighting hordes of warriors is is devastating and as expensive as they are. Uh, if you're not taking those other toys that are taking up so many of your points, you know, like we said, the Chimeras, Demon Prince, Hell Cannon, blah, 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 you can actually get a lot of guys in, especially if you're looking at 3,000 points. Maybe you're looking at three hordes of Chaos Warriors. Do you think that has any viability whatsoever? Well, I'm running one block of 30 Warriors, and they're not probably not going to be in Horde. I'll have to see when I get down the table how I want to deploy them. But they'll probably go six or seven wide. They're with Halberd's Shields, they're Marked of Corn, Musician Standard, and the Banner of Eternal Flame. And that's a 630-point unit. That could be my whole core at 2,500 points. And that's and that's one single unit, and, and it's an absolute ass-kicker. But it's it's still just one unit, and I think it can be chapped and redirected. I mean, movement four is what kills Warriors, in my opinion, I think. I think if they were movement five or six, like Forsaken, we'd be in a much better shape. But Warriors are pretty slow. You can back up. They, if you really wanted to, you could not fight them until turn four. And by four turns of magic and shooting, uh, I just don't know if we have the if we have the muscle. Um, also, on my list, I have four cheap chaff drops. The, the one thing I find is that I, I get a lot of that when I'm running this min core. I'm literally at 750 points. So I, 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 it's kind of against my ideology to take 1,500 points of core. It just it, it feels it feels wrong. So I don't know. I'll, I'll have to try it though. I, I definitely will after uh, after brawlers. Yeah, that, I guess that's one of the things that even though you know that could be an interesting idea, it probably wouldn't be the right thing to do at brawlers because of the way it's designed, where it's based off getting victory points. So if you have kind of like this slow trotting army, like you say, they're going to delay at least part of it. So you're not going to be getting the tablings you might get with a faster army that's full of knights and whatever else. Uh, is is are, are you actually like changing your list to be dealing with that with the victory points? Or are you still trying to really just base it around just making it as strong as possible? Well, I'm still running the Demon Prince and the two Chimeras. I'm running two level. I'm running a level two and a level one. Uh, the Demon Prince is a level four. So I'm running the same Monster Mash build. I'm running the Min Core block with the Warriors, and I'm running two units of four Skull Crushers because it gets me a better buy than the unit of Knights and the unit of Skull Crushers. So I'll have Skull Crushers either on either flank or on one flank to make a flank really heavy. But the concept of the army gets into your face and fights by turn two is still prevalent. I mean, there is the hard counter of cannons, but I've been playing against a lot of Empire, and I think the difference is that one extra cannon. Ogres, demons, dwarves, you know, they're mostly going to have about two cannons. Dwarves might have three, but Empire typically has three with engineers attached, and that one extra cannon is that extra shot on that Chimera. It's the shot on the Demon Prince turn two without the charm shield. It's that little extra bit, uh, and I think I can handle two cannons. So unless I come up against hard Empire or triple cannon spam, uh, I feel I feel reasonably confident about getting the Demon Prince win. Fair enough, fair enough. Now, while we're just talking about the charm shield there, I don't know if you saw that last report of mine, but I faced a guy where, you know, I, I didn't see a shield on the model, so I shot at him, and he's like, oh, well, it's, you know, it could be anything. It's a charm shoulder pad, right? What do you think about that? Is that something you actually need to model as a shield, or it's a magic item, so it's whatever you want? What's your take on that one? Uh, I think ninth edition GW would love it because we'd have to buy about twelve characters to try to model uh, every single thing. I mean, here's here's my demon prince, and he's got the charmed uh, little, he's got the charmed whatever that little is bracelet. Yeah. I don't know. That's that's <laughs> his that's that's his charmed item, and that's also his chaos armor, by the way. So I, I mean, I think it's abstract. I think as long as you have the model and it's and it's reasonable. I mean, when you start getting to axes and swords, now we're getting into 40k territory. Do you have a power lance? Or do you have a power axe or a power sword? I think the characters, especially with open lists, they have what they have, and uh, you know you can you can justify it away. I think the units need to be appropriate. I don't think I could take any web chill warriors and say they have halberds, but. A wizard's a wizard. If he has Spencer's blade and he just has a staff, it's a magical staff with two swords. So I'm I'm not a big stickler on that kind of stuff. That's actually a, a good point. Something I hadn't thought about before. Where before uh, that was the main thing we really pushed. Like whether it was a, a power or whatever, as long as it was a weapon, it could be. Yeah, sure, it's a sort of striking, it's just a mace, no big deal. But actually, yeah, with that new change there in 40K, where whether it's a mace or a sword or whatever is a big deal, maybe that's actually going to start changing. I wonder if it's actually going to start saying, if it says sword, it has to be sword and blah, blah, blah for fantasy as well. That would be pretty interesting. But like you say, you'd have to have a whole bunch of character models made up to be ready for this or to have it you know, magnetized with all these different things as well. Um, I think another part with this too is, I mean, there's always... At least around here, it's always been kind of generally accepted that you only need to have your front rank have, in fantasy, have the the right weapons. Is that not played there, or how's it in your area? 
Uh, for the casual tournaments, we don't really care. I mean, if you want to take Halo and Shield Warriors and call them that, obviously if your front rank is appropriately marked, and as long as you have warriors or goblins or whatever in the second rank spec, we really don't care. We're not too big of a stickler. I would certainly like to see your front rank be accurate, because that's all I really see anyway. Yeah. Um, so I wouldn't have a problem with it, but I'm, I'm pretty easygoing, so are the people around here. I mean, we have so few fantasy players that we don't want to chase anybody away, because you have a hand weapon shield and you want to run a halberd you know, for the for the friendly casual tournament. But uh, I think after a while, if you want to lock down and, you know, hopefully if you're going to run the Halberd Warriors all the time, get some Halberds or convert some up. But mm. Yeah, it's one thing if you just took it out for like, hey, let's for a lark, pull this out for this tournament or something. But like, yeah, like you say, if you're going to be doing this for a long term, just convert them up and make, make them right. Uh, I know this really affected me for my army choice for this tournament because I was really heavily thinking about the throng army with two or even three hordes of trolls and the thing is I'd have to heavily go on I mean I'm not going to be doing that with chaos trolls I mean nobody has that many it'd be so expensive to buy but I could do that with the amount of river trolls and common trolls that are around but that's the whole thing would it be accepted would it be okay I, I sent a message to the uh, tournament organizer and he didn't write back I don't know if he thought it was ridiculous or whatever but how about what were your thoughts on that one obviously you do wars of chaos would your friends be fine with you running common trolls or river trolls as chaos trolls? I, th I think they would be mad at me because of what I was running was a cheesy build, but certainly not the models. I mean, the models for trolls are hideous. They're old, they're from the 80s, they're very expensive, they have limited posability. They're just ugly models to begin with. I think the river trolls are the only major troll kit they've put out, except for Lord of the Rings in, what, 15 years? So very easily you can convert river trolls, and even if it's a bunch of river trolls, who really cares? You have the appropriate... They're trolls, they're on the right size bases, let's just go with that. And I'll just complain about the fact that you brought, what, 18 times 3 trolls hordes? And just, <laughs> I, I was drinking water when you said that, I almost spit it on the screen. Oh, yeah! Because <laughs> I can't face that many trolls. And that's the other thing, just real quick about the warriors. I mean, even with 30 warriors with halberds, the Ogre Iron Gut Star, the Troll Star, I can't beat that. And my, my trolls, my, my warriors are costing as much as your trolls. So... That's that's the other reason why I don't think the Warriors can muscle it. But but yeah, that's my feel on it. Run your trolls. I don't I don't care. I'll just take shots on my side of the board. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if I ever run that many trolls, they're just going to go and death snipe my character and they'll just all be useless. So, <laughs> but uh, I had a little comment here from uh, Johnny Krauss talking about how he actually has 15 drops with his uh, Warriors. Do you know if he's is he going to to brawlers with that or? I don't think he's going to Brawlers. I think that just happens to be his list, and I'm curious if that's at 2,500 points, because that's in a... Even at... Thir the cheapest drop you can get is 30, 30 points for 5 hounds. So that's a, that's quite a substantiated amount of hounds that... I mean, you're taking panic checks all over the place, because they're breaking and they're running away, and they're taking panic checks on top of themselves. Um, I think I'm running 4 hound drops for my basic... And I have about 10 or 11 drops in the army in total. I think that's plenty of drops. I think by the 4th or 5th drop... I've identified where your battle line's going to be, and I'm not going to be pulled. The problem with Warriors is if you wait the right and you go to the left, and I have to walk across the board on an angle, that's a problem. But by the fifth drop, you should put down something substantial enough that I can say, okay, this is where my Warriors are going, and my Skull Crushers and my Princes and my Chimeras, they're fast enough that they can be anywhere in two turns. So. Yeah, fair enough. I know in, in my list here, I'm just kind of looking over at the other one, I did not take a lot of drops, and my theory going into this was really that, like we said, it's all about just the the victory points you get, and so I want to take as many points to killing things as possible. So, I mean, I got one unit to, of wolves. I mean, you can kind of say my chariots are a drop, maybe my bunker, but for the most part, it's not like I'm running you know, multiple single trolls or lots of wolf riders to draw things out. All the points have been going into offensive units. Uh, I mean, obviously that could really come back to, to bite me in the butt, but for the most part, I have kind of a more defensive army. And, I mean, worst case scenario, I can always hand of gork something around, but uh, it's definitely a risk. Is that something you've considered? Just like, hey, I spend this many on hounds. If I take it out, this is another combat hero I can add. Is that really on the table or not really? Well, hounds are so cheap and warriors are so expensive that even 120 points basically gets me a naked exalted. So where in like Empire Land, that's two priests, and that's a great buy. Put them in any unit and they'll do fine. 
Uh, and, and warrior land, I mean, I can't even, I can just about get 10 naked warriors without even maybe shields. So I, I like the hounds as just chaff and redirectors, but I think with orcs and goblins, I mean, you've got pretty good shooting on top of foot. You could really sit back. And also, if it's, if it's really tight, you don't have to worry about a bad animosity check, pulling a unit out when you're way out in front. So I think orcs and goblins do really well, actually, when they sit back and, and can pew-pew you. And then if you charge me or I charge you, I'm plus one strength this round because of the choppers anyway. I don't really, I don't really care. Mm. And they have, yeah, I mean, I haven't played with my war machines for a while, but definitely having, you know, on my list there, the three chakas, two do doom divers, and two rock lovers, that can do a lot of damage. And, uh, I mean, again, it's it's really just built because of I'm scared about Warriors of Chaos. And, I mean, I kind of saw this building up with the other things, but now with all the monsters I could be expecting to see, it's I'm definitely scared. Uh, so right now in your army, it, it, like you said, it's not really finalized. What's really the areas of the army list that you're still kind of debating on? Well, right now I'm debating upon the magic space. I figured magic is fun, and at 3,000 points, let's try to do the best we can with that. So I'm running my level 4... Uh, Demon Prince that flies to death because it's just nice to cast death and snipe characters. With his speed, he'll be able to do that. I'm running a level 2 to metal. He's, he's there because I needed to take a scroll because a Demon Prince really can't take a scroll and he can't take all of his other gear. And then I figured with my remaining points, I could probably take a level 1 to fire and give him the Skull of Katan. So now I get all these channel dice, and I don't really care if he goes to leadership 0 and dies. And I could get quite a few dice not only in the, the, my magic phase but in my opponent's magic phase for dispelling. So um, that, that's where I'm kind of flexible. There's about 150 mm. points tied up in the level one I could probably do without. Um, but again, in Warrior Land, what am I really going to take for 150 points? So I, I think it's just going to stay the way it is. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a chariot right there and change. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it is a lot. I mean, because what level is that Demon Prince, you were saying? He's a, he's a four. He's a four, it's okay. Eight, it's eight wizard levels, which is a little bit heavy. Mm-hmm. Are you, are you still kind of worried? Because, I mean, uh, we've talked about it in, like, our different channels and stuff, but, I mean, for me, if I was running a Demon Prince and making him a level 4, I'm still going to be 6 dicing stuff. I don't care whatsoever. Because, to me, I mean, there is that risk there that you're going to, you know, cascade and pull yourself into the warp. But for the vast majority of the time, it doesn't even affect you. I mean, especially if you're in combat. I mean, sure, everybody around me gets hurt. That's fantastic. I get hit with a template. Hooray! I just kill more guys. Is that something you're still really worried about, or...? Uh, I'm embracing the warrior mentality, which is go hard or go home. But uh, yeah. also, also the nice thing with death is you don't with a level four you don't really need a lot of dice. Two or three dice, almost any of those spells out of there. I mean, death gets expensive when you have to cast at 24 inches. When you're only casting at 12 inches, I think death is a little bit easier to cast. So just throw two or three dice at the spell. I'm gonna have a lot of dice because I got what eight channel dice, you know, some some insane number like that, and uh, you know, hopefully two or three dice and stuff, and then save six dice for Searing Doom on your Monster's Cav or a big fireball on uh, your, your Horde of whatever. We have a comment here that the, the Skull Staff there can't channel the spell dice, but only power dice. I don't have my book of mine to confirm, but uh, if that was true... Well, I guess half your... my theory's gone. <laughs> well... <laughs> no, I'll still take... Uh, it's 15 points. I mean, if it gets me one or two extra power dice over the course of the game, that's another spell. I, I think for 15 points, it's still not a bad buy. I don't know what else I would take on my uh, my level one anyway. So. Yeah, I mean, you could always go with a power stone or something like that, but yeah, I mean, it's cheap. It's so cheap there for just 15 points. For the most part, you don't care about that loss of leadership, so not that big of a loss. Is there any other part of your list you're kind of playing with and trying to figure out what to do with it? Uh, it depends on what hour you catch me at. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, right now, I, I, I went with, uh, when I talked to uh, Steve Bizzle a few days ago, I went with the Exalted Hero of Zeech on a demonic mount, uh, and basically he's just on a standard horse, and he's going to be my BSB, and he's going to roam free, because when I took the knights out, I was like, well, BSB used to go in the knight block. I don't want to put him on a skull crusher. That's really expensive. If he's frenzied, then he can get sniped by a cannonball. So he's got a three-up ward, and he's re-rolling ones. He's got three wounds. He's got a one-up armor save. So he's pretty good, and I'm figuring I'd rather have a cannonball go at my BSB than go at my demon prince. So it's kind of playing to the game of I have lots of high-priority targets for you to shoot at in magic, but which one are you going to pick? Which one are you going to go after? So... Again, it's that hard, aggressive stance. He's even got the, the stupid five-point potion when he charges, he gets plus one attack. So he's putting out, him and his mount are putting out like nine attacks on the charge, which is pretty, I mean, he could he could break a unit 
uh, by himself there, a small caveat or something. Yeah, and that's very true. I mean, with all the other targets, they're probably not going to shoot at him anyway. And if they do, it'll just be a waste because it's going to make that, that ward save, and there you go. Do you have room on there to make him stubborn as well? Does it tie up a unit? or? That would be a good idea. I don't think I have the points for it, though, in his basic war gear because you got to take the Talisman of Prez to give him the 4-up, and that's a 45-point item. I mean, unless you, if you don't give him the Talisman of Prez, he's really susceptible, but the 3-up with the re-rolling 1s is really... That's pretty solid. I'm sure I'll, I'm sure I'll roll a 2 and fail it, but I mean, I, I can only blame myself at that point. And I mean, even without the stubborn, I guess he could always just run up and hold something up anyway, because you're already getting the plus one for the, the banner. He's going to be killing a, at least a few stuff. So, I mean, if anything, he might be losing by like one or something, and he'll get the re-roll. Should be fine. But, I mean, just trying to think of different options out there. Um, anything, any other part of your list? I mean, I, I heard you say you're starting to hate Hell Cannons now. Yeah, the Hell, cannon, the hell Cannon's long gone. I feel like you need to have two of a war machine to make it reliable. One is none, two is some, and the, the Hell Cannon, I mean, once per game, it's going to go crazy, and it's not going to do anything. And it might even lurch itself into a position where, like, a horde of savages can charge it, and they will kill it. And that's, like, a 210-point model. It's not a, it's not a small piece of change. And uh, one turn, it's going to misfire, and it's going to, like, make your wizard take a miscast and look at sucked into the warp. Or he'll eat all his crew and become completely inept in, uh, at doing anything in the game. He'll be worse than a troll, I think, on leadership. I think he's leadership, like, five or four or something. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think the Hell Cannon's fun, but, uh, I mean, if I land it on your unit on the flank and it's a panic check and minus run and one and you run off the board, it's not really fun for you either. I'm worried about it killing myself, so if it's not fun for either of us, why, why really take this unreliable thing that we both really hate at the end of the day? Yeah, I guess that's fair. I mean, it, it's actually, you know, kind of noble of you of taking things out of your army that, you know, if they'd be no fun for your opponent there. I know I have one guy here that loves Hell Cannons, and I mean, from the last edition to this one, they just got better because now they have a 5-plus ward as well. But, I mean, I guess you don't have the same tricks anymore. You don't have the minus one leadership banner you can go and kind of put with that. And like you say, it's so many points, and... Uh, I mean, are you worried about taking out monsters? I mean, that's one of the nice things you can use it for. What do you have that instead that's going to be dealing with if you saw, you know, another Demon Prince or something like that? Well, I think the Lord Death has some pretty good spells to just snipe monsters. I mean, the one thing I'm afraid of with my Chimeras, besides uh, Panic Checks without the Demon Prince and the BSB nearby, is one of the spells out of Death. I forget it, but it's Leadership versus Leadership. I think it's the generic signature spell. They're Leadership 5. So, I mean, a wizard's just going to pick it up yeah. off the board, and that's that's a good way to deal with monsters. Also, I'll fly my Demon Prince into it, and we'll have a monster, we'll have a monster mash. I mean, we already had Hell Cannons made on my channel, so when a Demon Prince and another monster come together, there might be truly something special, but we'll have to see. Yeah, because I mean, the one thing about the Demon Prince is, it's going to hold him up, but because a lot of his damage output is from the, the Thunder Stomp, I mean, obviously both of you are missing out on that. I guess, I mean, in a pinch, you'll, you'll do whatever you need to do, right? So, and I mean, that death magic obviously is a really good way to get them, especially if they're outside of the general's leadership and all that fun stuff. Uh, for my part, I mean, before I fell back to War Machines, my real defense of it would be trying to put in a, a combat character or my Night Goblin just to go and tie it up. But, of course, I go so cheap on characters now, I'm not going to bother doing that and... Uh, I do have the Night Goblins back in my list again, so that's a possibility. But uh, I also got the five Night Goblins with the big bosses with, you know, the great weapons. So they have their own little things they can be doing, I guess. Um, something there to also kind of see what you think it's going to kind of go through there. Because Brawler's Bash had their whole FAQ come out talking about the different things like Congo lines and how it's going to be dealt with. So it really seems like they're trying to change it over to kind of more fair play. If, if I use those night goblins for say like the double fleet tactics you think that's something else is going to be caught by that and really frowned upon I, I think fleeing's a core mechanic I think the undead crumble rule only came about after GW's FAQ I placed I, I played the chaff sticks once with Bretonia which has a really inflexible play style I think a good player can still deal with them but uh, I appreciate them comping that out because that's not really in the spirit of the game that's not what the game was designed for but I think if you're going to double flee I mean that that's Wood Elves' entire strategy is double flee, you know. So can you really take that out of the game? I, I I don't think so. I don't think you can you can you know break a whole army's knee because somebody can do a double flee reaction. So if, if you want to do that, you know that's fine. Uh, that's why I have flying monsters. They'll just go right over that. They don't care. 
Yeah, pretty much. Uh, we had one comment here saying, "Why don't you put the three plus word, uh, one plus, or plus one word on the demon prince?" I mean, that's not even possible, right? Because you don't have enough points to put on the the talisman or anything. The the lore of Tazinch doesn't, or sorry, the mark of Tazinch doesn't affect in the same way. So what? The best you could do is just a five plus with re-rolling ones, right? Isn't that the best you can do in a demon prince? Yeah, that and the charm shield, and that's not quite honestly worth it. I mean, him to, to meddle or, or anything is not that great. Um, the Zeech ability isn't that great. So, I mean, to hamstring the entire 500-point investment to, to, to re-roll ones and not be Nurgle and Death and all that minus one to hit so you hit it on sixes, I mean, it's it's not really worth it. It's like putting the cart in front of the horse. It's not, it's not viable, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe just kind of like switching gears now, what do you think about the new High Elf release? And well, it's not out, but of course, all the leak stuff is out. And talk about how they're going to be losing Always Strike first. How do you think this is going to really give me changing the list here? Because I mean, obviously, I play them now, and I'm keenly interested. But it's uh, you know they're talking about it's probably going to lose a lot of points on a lot of guys. Blah blah blah. It almost seems like they're going to kind of lose their flavor. What do you think about that? Uh, I don't think Always Strike First is that important, because when it was written in 7th edition, it was great. I strike first, I clear the front rank because I'm super elite, and I just, you know, win combat and I walk away. With Step Up now, I mean, if, you're, if your horde of Night Goblins goes into them, do you really care if they're striking first and they're re-rolling to hit? I don't think it makes a, a big difference to you. You're going to step up and you're going to stab them with a spear because they're toughness 3 with a 5 up and they're going to die. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't think that that really matters to them. I think the important thing is that they're not probably going to be always strike last with great weapons. So those hordes of things are viable. Um, I think the fact that we heard Phoenix Guard would be unbreakable is just like wait for the guy to take the hundred Phoenix Guard horde in the min core and go there's my army and now you can't get it because uh, Infernal Gateway doesn't exist anymore. Um, the flying chariot with the the flying thing with the crossbow on the back. I mean, I guess everybody's getting a flying war machine now. War machines don't go on the ground anymore. Um, but I, I think the high elves will be interesting. I think they're going to kind of wind up where where warriors are, where they're, they're not at the bleeding edge, but they're a nice balanced middle of the road book. And I think that's where GW's kind of going with with everything. So. Yeah, because one of the things I was thinking about is the whole fact that, I mean, like you said, I mean, hitting first usually didn't matter. I mean, when you got enough models, it doesn't really matter who hits first, but a big thing is that re-roll the hit. And so, I mean, one of the things that makes units like Bastagors or Executioners so good is that they hit hard and they're re-rolling that. So you don't have to worry about, you know, the rubber Lance syndrome, where you just screwed up your your to hit rolls, and look, I got devastated. And I mean, just trying to think of the way they're going to play out, it almost seems like they're going to be turning into sort of like a fast empire. But then again, looking at what they're coming out with, with all the new Phoenix and all that stuff, maybe they're trying to turn them to be like a monster army, just like Warriors of Chaos as well. So I mean, there's also rumors I heard too. I don't know if it was denied now that they're going to be getting the Tree Man. Have you heard anything about that? What a tile to get in the tree man? No, I hope I hope not. <laughs> the tree man belongs in the forest of Avalorn with the Bretonians, and that's that's where he belongs. But yeah, I mean, welcome to Warriors. I mean, you got great stats, but don't roll twos and ones because you're you're gonna get punished for it. And that's what makes you know Empire and Undead so good is that reliability and that consistency. Um, so yeah, you're gonna win big or lose big. Difference too that your toughness four and we're toughness three, and you have a three plus armor save, and we have a Five plus armor save, so there's that difference too. But <laughs> well, you're not going last with your great sword. <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, that's I mean, obviously, I'm getting that matchup a lot with my brother with this uh, slow grow lead with my high elves versus his warriors, and just seeing that. I mean, man, I mean, with that initiative being pretty much the same for the most part. I mean, sure, if you're sword masters, you're a little bit faster and all these things, but. Uh, when you're being hit at the same time, and you're not going to be taking those hits away, those warriors just kill the high elves like crazy. But uh, I mean, with the reroll being or the always strike first being gone, so it is completely first with the rerolls. I don't know how that matchup's going to go anymore. I mean, before it's like, oh yeah, sword masters go get those warriors. I don't know what's going to be the the best thing to take anymore. Maybe it will be the phoenix guard and all that fun stuff. Well, I expect to see a lot of uh, Silver Helms in core, because I think your core is pretty terrible, and them going to core is really going to change the dynamic of the army. You saw those flying uh, Pidgeotto-type things. I don't know what they're going to be, uh, but they're going to be like your flying monster calves. So you might turn into a very fast army. I, I don't really know what to say, but maybe you'll suffer the warrior syndrome where you know the core of your army where these hyper-elite elves 
and they're not really the core of your army anymore, much like warriors kind of wound up not being warriors anymore. I hope not, but, yeah, I mean, based upon trends, it could very well happen. Mm -hmm. So I guess, I mean, at this point, we just got to see what happens. But here's something else I, I was wondering what your thoughts were on, where uh, they were coming out with a lot of books here, and, of course, they, I mean, it's just bam, bam, bam. Every month, it seems there's another release, another release. And to me, I think this is fantastic. I mean, maybe GW is listening to the fans, and they did this because, hey, they want these releases sooner, so that's why we're going to be doing this. Whereas other people say that, oh, it's just a cash grab and blah, blah, blah. What, do you think it's just a cash grab? Do you think it's actually they're making a, a good-hearted attempt to actually update all the books in time? Which way do you think? I, I think it's a, I think it's a little bit of both. I think they realize that a stable meta is bad for sales. When you get three or four months to chew on a book, and don't forget, they used to go fantasy 40k, fantasy 40k. So if they were going to release four books in a year, two fantasies, two 40k, you and I would have six months to chew on the most recent book. We'd break it down to its most minute detail. We'd exclude half the models and say they're garbage and they're not worthwhile taking. When a book's coming out every month, and the next fantasy book's going to come out in two months. You have to buy that one-click bundle because something might be good and it might only be good for two months and your tournament's coming up and there's this whole sequence of events here. So I think the unstable meta is a good thing and I think also having a lot of armies up to date. I mean, they have a lot of lagging sales in some armies like Bretonia, like Wood Elves. So if they can get every army producing, and I mean, the only thing is with, with Warhammer, you either have an army for high elves or you don't. And they want everybody to have an army for, for every faction. So if everything's updated, it'll entice people to keep collecting and buying to the next army. Yeah. I know for my part, it really has me on my toes because, of course, the Demons of Chaos just came out. I haven't even faced them yet, and all of a sudden now High Elves are coming out again. So, ugh, it's, it's, I mean, something that we talked about last time is just the whole challenge to be trying to stay on top of all the rules all the time. And, of course, when this happens, and especially if you're playing both Fantasy and 40K, try to keep in line with both of these because, I mean, right now, uh, I mean, I, I, I've stopped buying the 40K books just because I've, I've just decided, you know what, I'm just not going to be competitive anymore. But I know for yourself, I mean, you're going to have to check out the Tau now, and then just when you're trying to wrap your head around the Tau, okay, I need to do that. I mean, what do you think about that challenge there? Well, I, 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 I've kind of selected that I'm going to stick to fantasy, and I'm going to focus head down on that. Uh, typically, I get the not-so-legal PDF, nice phone pictures of the book. So that's how I stay kind of on top of it. But for 40K, I mean, my guard is my guard, and it's going to stay blobby, and it's just going to do its thing. For Warriors, I feel like the build is the build, and that's how Warriors are going to operate for me. And, you know, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to tailor to face High Elves, because like you said, the meta is going to choose in two months, and the people who hop armies are going to hop in two or three months to Lizardmen, and then maybe the Dwarves at the end of the year. And, uh, no, I haven't even read the, the, the Demons of Chaos book yet. Uh, I guess I should get on that before the tournament so I actually know what's going on. So. Well, I don't even know if, the, if they're using the new Demon of Chaos book there, but from what I've seen, I actually don't even think we'll, we'll really see many of them. They're just so random, and I mean, the whole fact now that the, the Heralds won't be as, as solid anymore, uh, you just don't see, I, I don't see them as being competitive anymore. Of course, I haven't played them. Uh, of course, the Skull Cannon looks amazing. It's just anything outside of that really doesn't impress me. I mean, before or I'd see hordes of the blood letters with a herald, and that's very scary. But now it's it's not because they got worse. Your herald doesn't have armor anymore unless he gets really lucky. So I don't know. They might be there, the the few odd number. But I mean, out of eighty players, maybe just a small handful. Who knows? But uh, yeah, I mean. Uh, just something, a comment to the people walk, watching. If you want us to talk about something, just please put it up in the comments. We can go and talk about it. But uh, maybe I'll turn it over to you, Anthony. What What's on your mind? What do you want to talk about? Well, just about an hour ago, I, I don't know if you watch him because he is mostly 40K-centric. Wave Sam Han put up a video about uh, the, the, the problem with Warhammer Fantasy and how 40K players, and in the Northeast, which he's in White Plains, New York, I think it's like an hour away from here, uh, you know, it's very anti- high fantasy. It's very, you know, I'm not going to play fantasy. I'm all about 40K. And he's like, what's the issue with fantasy? And I tried to answer it, but it's probably one of the hardest questions I've ever gotten. Like, you know, how do I start fantasy in my area if I have 40K players? Um, you know, how do I sell people on the game because they're just not interested? What's your what's your take on that? And, you know, the differences between 40K and fantasy and how you would even get that started in your area? 
Um, I mean, I, I brought a few guys over to fantasy, and really the big thing I found is that a lot of people are, for some whatever reason, put off by the whole actual fantasy part of it. That look, there's orcs, there's dragons and monsters and weird things. I mean, over in 40k, I mean, it's a lot of tanks, it's a lot of soldiers, blah blah blah, and you get a lot of people, especially people that are also in the army that love coming to this and kind of having like a board game version. I mean, of course, the funny thing is that there's orcs and there's elves. Tau in 40k as well, but it seems like when they want to transfer over, it's like, oh, what's the, an elf riding a, a griffin? This is just weird and silly, and they just want to stay away from it. And uh, it's also kind of a bias I, I see from just completely on their side, because I mean, when I'm talking to fantasy people and I'm trying to introduce them to 40k going the other way or to War Machine, they're very open about it. But whenever I'm talking to so the 40k guys, like, what about War Machine, what about Fantasy? No, they just block it right out. So I really don't know what it is about that mentality. Uh, one of the things I've talked to my brother about is that a lot of 40k players are also very in it for the whole uh, fluff aspect behind it. They love the idea of, you know, just the Space Marine, blah, blah, blah. And you really don't, I mean, I think you said that yourself in your video. I actually did catch it before I was waiting to get this thing all set up. That there is no real Space Marine in Fantasy. There's no, like, this is the good guys. I mean, there's Empire, but they're kind of more like the generic guys, right? They're kind of more like the guard. So maybe it's that, that they don't have anything that they can just really key on to, and they like the, the fluff aspect of it, and don't really get to the tactical side of it, but uh, really when I, to kind of get back to the question there, when I'm trying to introduce more people is I'll bring it down to the more of the, the common things, right? These are your knights, these are your archers, this is your chariot, and I, I leave the monsters and the magic and stuff away from it and try and keep it more common. Um, is that kind of what you're looking for? Or? Yeah, I, I think that I, I think any answer is as good as any. I mean, I, I don't pretend to have an answer over here on this side. Um, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think 40K also appeals to the younger generation, and, you know, this hobby is, you know, most people who play this hobby start off when they're young, when they're teenagers, and then they play it into their their older ages, like you and I. Uh, I don't see a lot of people 25, 30 starting this from scratch. So, naturally, the sci-fi, 40K, easier game to play. GW does a better marketing campaign on that side. And I, I like fantasy because it's like Game of Thrones. You know, everybody's good and evil at the same time. Everybody's out for themselves. Everybody could kind of beat somebody else, but because somebody else is backstabbing them, they can't quite get it done. And even if they could, there's infighting and they can't really get it done anyway. So I like that whole dynamic uh, aspect of fantasy. But yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate, but most of the 40k players I find go to warm courts. They just jump the whole ship and, and go right there. So Really? Okay. I, just, I mean, over here I just see a lot of animosity where they just, I don't know, they just look at the jacks of the war machine and just stay right away. Uh, something else I, I think maybe I'm just thinking now that really stems this animosity as well is that a lot of people when you talk to them talk about the tactics of fantasy. And it could be a thing that if you're a 40k player, they're saying like, what do you mean? There's no, you're saying there's no tactics in my game? You think it's a childish game? And maybe that kind of starts that animosity. But I mean, come on, man. I mean, there's gun lines in fantasy, but pretty much all of 40k is just pew, pew, pew from across the board, right? Uh... Uh, so, I mean, uh, obviously, that's not what we would be talking about. If you're trying to introduce something like, hey, your game sucks and you're a sucker, come over to this game. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I can definitely see that when you have people talking about that, that they'll just say, like, no, what? Screw you. Screw your fantasy. I'm just going to stick with my 40K. It's awesome. So maybe that's part of it, too. But fantasy is better. So what do you got to say? <laughs> Can't disagree. Uh, I was actually wondering if you're... I was wondering in your video there too whether you're going to be getting kind of like lash back because you I mean you pretty much said the same thing that you fantasy you like it more and you kind of just said it here too where you're kind of like putting 40k on the background but uh, I mean is that kind of pretty much your feeling too that fantasy is just really the more tactical game? I, I find it to be way more tactical. I find that you know when you have to take a couple turns to make something happen, which is what fan which which is what fantasy is. 40k. Literally, and it's my army in 40k, I could not move all game. I could deploy, not do movement, not do assault, not do psychic powers, and just shoot. Just wait for your shooting phase. I mean, when when everybody can buy a wall, I mean, that's like if everybody could buy a watchtower. Could you imagine if everybody could buy a watchtower in fantasy and just put as many guys in there as you want, your level four is on top, giving the finger to everybody? You know, that's, that's I mean, that's, that's the uh, GS defense line for 40k. 
So, I, I mean, I, I hope fantasy never gets to that point. Uh, I'm a little bit afraid because GW wants to drive sales and 40K drives it. But, um, yeah, I mean, I find it to be more basic. And like I said, they're good players. They know the rules. They know their armies. But at the end of the day, it's, it's basic. Who's, who pew-pews more efficiently? That's, that, that's where it begins and ends. Yeah, I mean, especially I mean, the way that the newest edition works, I mean, I, I really tried pushing the combat element of it, but it just doesn't work. I mean, between you taking your losses in the front, having that random charge distance, and then when you charge, they get to, you know, shoot back you, kill more from the front, so it's even harder to make that charge. It just really favors the shooty army. For the most part, the, the units that only do the moving are the flyers. That's it. And they're just flying around the chute from different angles. I'm pretty sure if you could have a flyer that, you know, could just be in hover mode and get their, you need sixes to hit, they wouldn't move the fly either. Just sit there and, <laughs> but. <laughs> well, the okay. one thing I, well, the one thing I always do say to the, the 40K players is I take the little nuggets that they said in 8th edition about fantasy, you know, all oh, random charge distance makes the game bad. All oh, these overpowered magic spells. And then when 6th edition comes out, I go, you have random charge distance. You're living with it. If you roll up Iron Arm on your Tyranid uh, Lord, you know, he's he's unbreakable. He's unbeatable. So you have the same things we do. Tell me again why my game system is inferior to yours. Yeah. Uh, we had something here just saying, you know, is steampunk, steampunk becoming more popular than traditional sci-fi in your area in regards to, to mini games? I know over here, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to say. I know War Machine does have a, a, a good standing, but it has for a while. I can't really say that steampunk, steampunk as an idea is getting even bigger than sci-fi. Is that anything you're seeing over there? Uh, the people who also play fantasy will also play a lot of uh, warm hordes. More hordes than war machine. I think it goes, again, we're more fantasy than 40k centric here, so uh, hordes makes more sense to us than the steampunk side of it. But, um, I, I mean, nobody's playing Dystopian Wars. Dystopian Wars is very steampunk. Malifaux is pseudo-steampunk. Nobody's really playing that, that either. I don't mm -hmm. think... I think steampunk's a genre, but I don't think it's it's driving the sales. I don't think it's steampunk. I think it's War Machine and Hordes are good games. And and they're they're kind of middle of the road between, you know, the 40K and the fantasy aspect. They take a little bit of both. So I, I think that's what's popular about it. I don't think it has anything to do with the fact that it's steampunk's just a style, in my opinion. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, getting to opinion here and stuff, uh, one of the videos I did recently that had probably the, the most downvotes I've had in quite a while is when I was talking about the GW policy and how I was saying, well, just ignore the policy, think more about if you like the models, buy it. And uh, yeah, people weren't too pleased with me. But what, what's kind of your take on that whole situation? Well, I, I think it all depends upon where you are in your life and you know what game system you play. Um, I think Warhammer can be sometimes a bit more expensive than 40k because we just can't buy a tank. We just can't, you know, buy a flyer. Um, but it's not that much cheaper. Uh, I, th I think overall, I've gone from building an army to a certain points level and saying, this is my 2,500 point list. I have no other models outside of this list, and I have to bring basically the same thing every game. So now I'm a collector. I have like 4,000 points of warriors. I'm never going to play a 4,000 point game, but I'm more into just collecting the army and, and scaling down the amount of armies I have and going for more of a quantity in that. Um, but, you know, coming from the adult perspective, I mean, any other hobby I go do, whether it be hunting or, or fishing or golf or you know, paintball, those are all very expensive too. So when I put it up against those other hobbies, uh, you know, trips and traveling, 40K in fantasy is actually more cost effective and I get more hours between the assembly, the painting, and the playing. If you, if you wrap all of that together, if you just want to play, it's not that cost efficient. But if you want to build and you want to paint and you want to, you know, play the game and, and talk about your army and do cool stuff with it, then actually for what you pay, it's not that expensive for the amount of hours of entertainment you get out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that wasn't really what I was going after us. Uh, but anyway, just with that, I mean, yeah, my wife does scrapbooking. And I mean, just buying the paper and the stamps and all those things is, is ridiculous. I, I would actually rather buy, I mean, I could spend $40 to buy two stamps or I can get a box of guys. But anyway, what I was talking about is they had that, that policy where, of course, it makes it a lot harder for the, the online stores to really be selling things. You saw mini wargaming closing. And because of all that, you had people saying, like, you know, screw GW, time to ban them, blah, blah, blah. And really what I was saying was that don't even bother. They target the younger people, not the older people. You're banning them. It's just ruining your own hobby. Just 
if you like the models in the game, buy it. Forget whatever GW does in the background, that doesn't matter. Just buy the armies you like and, and play the game that you love. Uh, but like I said, I got a lot of downvotes from people that think that, you know what, you got to think about what they're doing in the background as well. Which way do you really go with that? Do you really look at GW's background when you're, when you're buying models? Well, I, I do look at the background mainly because early on in the before time when I had my old channel, I really dug my own grave saying, you know, I have all this business acumen. And, and in reality, compared to some of the channels out there who run stores and stuff, I really don't. I'm really an outsider looking in with some business basic knowledge, and I try to pick it apart, but I, I don't think I'm that successful at it. Um, I, I don't worry too much about it. I mean, I enjoy the game. When it becomes unsustainable for me to make more purchases, I have an army, and I'm just going to, you know, play that army and uh, you know, be mature about it, scale my budget back, and buy maybe one box a month. I mean, one $40 box a month, that's pretty affordable considering most people will spend you know, 30 to $50 a week on lunch and coffee going to work. Mm. So, I, I mean, we won't, no, I won't be able to maybe buy the 2,500-point army in, in one click, but if I'm smart about it, if I take my time, if I don't go from 0 to 2,500 points, if I build up like you do, are doing with your brother, 500, 1,000, you learn the army along the way. You make smarter purchasing decisions. You don't have so much waste, and um, you know, start enjoying the game at lower points values, and and, and then really just dig into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and ours is even slower than that, right? It's just like a hundred and fifty point jumps is what we're planning for every month. So yeah, that's really just one box. Not even. I mean, you get some of the stuff. It's more than one hundred fifty points. So it's it's really going to be pretty easy that way to to be doing that. Uh, maybe something that you were talking about before there is you said that you'd never play a four thousand point game. Uh, of course, it's kind of hard to put it on because you need to find people that can play it. It takes more time, blah, blah, blah. But I've played some larger games, you know, 8,000, 10,000, and they were fantastic. Is it just because, you know, you said you wouldn't play it because your, your, your opponents over there don't have that size, you're just not interested? Or what was kind of the idea there? Well, I, I honestly don't care. I mean, if we were going to play a 4,000 or 5,000 coin game, anything beyond 3,000, I'm not thinking really tactically anymore. I'm stretching for points. Everything goes in, champions and shields on everybody, you know, and we're just, it's apocalypse at that point, and it's not really worth thinking too strategically, because once you go to Grand Army, it's like, man, it'd be really good if I had eight chimeras. I'm not going to buy eight chimeras just for the time I play Grand Army. No, I'm just going to take what I have and, you know, put wizarding hats and the folding fortress in there and just, you know, have fun with it. I certainly would play it, but, you know, the most the people I play with play 2,500. Even getting them to stretch to 3,000 for brawlers has been quite a, quite a challenge. I've had to play some 2,500-point games to try to prepare for brawlers. So, I mean, it's really what, my, what the people around here play, but, I mean, I'll take my 5,000 points against two 2,500-point lists, let's, you know, but that's a fun night. I'm not, I'm not looking to, like, be like, man, how can I play 5,000 points more strategically? Hmm. I mean, like, for my part, I mean, the way I usually see it is, of course, you have to have some controls in there because some things can get silly, right? Because, of course, if you're playing as dwarves in a large game, great, you have 12 dispel dice every single time. But uh, one of the things I've found with the larger games, it almost kind of like balances things out. Because like you say, sure, if you're playing a smaller game, all the Dark Elf players are going to have two Hydras. You go to the grand scale, they don't have the four. Or, you know, if they have the, the best unit, right? You're only going to take that once. Uh, the crazy items you see, it's only going to be there once. The crazy spells. I mean, whereas like in a small game, somebody gets off Dwellers and it's like, oh, the the game's over, sun. When in a larger game, yeah, you, know, you got off uh, a purple sun, you killed off all my trolls, well, there's another unit of them, and you guys kind of keep going. And I mean, it, it probably is best, like you say, just to kind of play it fun and throw in whatever you want, but uh, I've actually, I don't know, I, I, I think there's actually like a deeper level there of tactics you can get to, and we have a, a comment here that they want to see you try out a, a 4K game, so maybe that could be something up here in the future. Uh, we have another comment here saying, what do you prefer? To build up one army over many years or doing multiples? Uh, I'm, I'm bored very quickly, so I like to change armies. I'm already thinking about what I want to play after Warriors because Warriors has a very distinct play style and GW has retired my Bretonians to the keep. Um, so right now I've really only got one army that I actually bring out. But I like to collect an army and, and when I feel like I've reached a point where I don't want to buy models that are ugly or grossly uncompetitive that I'm never going to use, uh, I look at my budget and I say, okay, in a month or so I can maybe start collecting another army and, and what is that army going to be. So I like to have a whole bunch of armies. You know, for the players that can only afford one army or only have the time to do one or two armies, I can bring the flavor. I can bring a different army every week. I can bring uh, a different list every week for the same army. So I like to collect my armies large and I like to collect as many as possible. So hopefully I'll be able to do that this year. 
Yeah, I know for my brother's part, he just he's kind of the same thing. He starts an army, gets bored, gets a new one. I mean, right away he'll be starting off Tau for I think not the second or third time. But uh, for my part, it's just when you look at it, where you buy your army, you spend all this money on it, and then you sell it, and you only get say like a third or a half of the the money back. You're just kind of losing money. So I usually just try and hold on to them. And like you say, it can make it. You can only make so many changes usually to your list to kind of freshen things up because really, like, oh, you took orcs with spears instead of orcs with two choppas, like big change, right? Or you just take a completely different army and it plays completely different. Uh, one of the things I'm really finding now that's a challenge though with that is just finding the space for all these armies because especially now that GW is moving to all these larger pieces, I mean, my dwarves are great. I have 5,000 points of dwarves in one large case and that's fantastic. But with my high elves, I'm already starting to wonder. I mean, I got a case for them, but you got the eagles in there, you got the griffins. Obviously, now there's going to be these new big things coming out, and it's just it's getting a lot a lot harder to store them. I mean, I can see behind you, you got a pretty big room there to storing things, but you know, for yeah, yeah. I mean, there's boxes everywhere. I don't really have a good way. My Bretonian army also got retired because so many lances broke. And anyone who's ever tried to pin a reglue a lance back on, you just get another arm. You don't, you don't, you don't go down that road. Um, but yeah, transportation is quite an issue. Warriors are quite small. I'm worried about taking them to brawler. Still, they're still fragile. Um, I, I always find, although when I paint my army, once I paint a model, I'm not going to sell it because now I've invested too much of myself in there, and also I've messed the model up way beyond anybody else wanting to strip it. Because um, I'm not painting golden demon here. I mean, this is base coats and washes. So I find if I paint my army, I'll hold on to it. And uh, for transport, I mean. Shoe boxes, foam, whatever you can find. I mean, I save every box I get just to, you know, try to put stuff in. But, I, I mean, unless you're going to drop as much money on your army as you did in Battle Foam, I don't I don't see it being a... Uh, I don't know how you transport the Mortis engine. I, I, I still don't know. In a shoe box covered with <laughs> lots and lots of foam. And then, of course, you've got the guys that are running multiple Mortis engines and, say, like, two Terror Geists and all this stuff just... Oh, I mean, a shoebox isn't good enough anymore. You need to have another box. I know for my brother, when he's running his Imperial Guard, he'll have his case, he'll have all of his guys, and then this massive banker's box, which is just for his vendettas. That's it. And then usually another small box is just for his chimeras, right? And it's just <laughs> ridiculous the amount of stuff you need to bring sometimes. So it is definitely a, an issue. Uh, definitely something I'm thinking that I really need to eventually get to is the whole magnetizing thing, right? Where all you need to do is if, if you have a display tray, magnetize them to this display tray and you're done. Everything's there. Is that anything you would think is worthwhile? Uh, yeah, actually, I have. Uh, unfortunately, my magnetization is um, vent covers, which are you know cheap vent sheets that you can flip over. It's, a, it's a strong enough to tilt the unit side to side, but not enough to flip it upside down and shake it, which is really what you need if you're going to transport the unit uh, constantly in there. Uh, I've seen some metal sheets from Shogun Miniatures. My buddy Doug picked that up. And if you use regular rare earth magnets, there's actually that pole where you can flip the unit upside down and shake it. Um, so I'd like to go to that. I also saw that somebody actually made like a display box and it had metal sheets in there and they were different varying heights. So you could put like an eagle in there or something and you can have a small tray where you put all your rank and file guys now that would work for like a warrior's army. If you're going to run orcs and goblins, I don't think you're going to fit 250 goblins in there. But um, I think people are getting creative with their transportation methods, and uh, you know, some metal sheets and magnets I think are, are well worth your investment, both for transport and for for playing. Fair enough. Uh, so we're getting kind of close to the end here. I mean, wh what's something else you want to talk about? I mean, of course, probably some people are watching this will want to know like our opinions on some tactics on some or something like that. Is there Something on your mind that you want to talk about there? Not in particular, but what do you? If you had to take a guess right now, what do you think the the top few armies are going to be at Brawlers, both in terms of what people bring and what's probably going to be in the top like ten percent of the of the win category? What do you What do you think is going to slot up there? I would say that the two most popular armies that I'm expecting to see is going to be the Warriors of Chaos and Empire. Uh, I mean. They're two very recent armies. They're both very powerful. Uh, of course, Wars of Chaos more so because they're new. Empire because they have all the cannons to do with the new stuff. Uh, I mean, sure, there's dwarves. Uh, they will also have cannons, but the thing is with them is that in a type of thing here where it's Brawler Bash, you need to get lots of victory points. Dwarves don't do that so, so well. They sit across the board, they do some shooting, and they kind of grind you down. So I really think those will be the two most popular ones. Uh, at the end of the day, I'm... 
I think uh, I would say that you're going to see Empire up there, and I would think I'm not. I'm, the thing is, I'm really on the fence about Warriors of Chaos because they are good and they have all the tools they need to really score these big victory points. But because everybody's playing to beat them. I don't know if it's going to work out, but really, if I can now break it down to three, it'd be Empire, Dark Elves, and Warriors of Chaos, which I expect to see up there. But of course, the number one spot will be my Orcs. So I mean, that's already taken. <laughs> but, <you know. laughs> yeah, right. I, I wish I shared your optimism for Warriors. I, I think Warriors came out like number six or number seven in the Codex scale, and um, I expect to see Empire up there, and I expect to see Ogres up there. I mean. If I had to do this this army in three months from start to finish, man, this is great tournament. Malorian's going. I gotta kick his ass. What am I gonna take? I'm gonna take you know ogres because I just need to get iron guts and the double cannons. And for a couple hundred dollars, it's all plastic. It's cheap. It's pretty simple to play. It's kind of point and click, and it's it's very good. And it can deny points at the same time. It moves across the board quickly, and it goes and gets points. So I expect to see ogres up there. Uh, I agree that vampire counts and like you know dwarves don't get a lot of points. They're more about point denial. But I expect ogres in the empire actually to be up there. Oh, I hope I see some ogres. I love facing ogres. I actually had a, a female actually that sent me a message saying, "Oh yeah, you think you could beat ogres? I want to play you when you come for the free gaming." So that's going to be kind of interesting. But I mean, man, I mean, just when you compare the the ogres to the orcs and goblins, I just I just can't wait for it. But I know. My curse is going to be is that in every single game, I'm going to face some death magic, and it's going to be, oh, general's dead, general's dead, general's dead, trolls being stupid, <laughs> you know. But, you know, that's one of the things. I mean, you just have to kind of go with it with being optimistic, going, let's go. Oh, I failed animosity, and my guys are fighting each other. Hooray, let's keep going, because <laughs> bad stuff's going to happen, and you just might as well enjoy it, right? So... I think those that embraced, I mean, it's five games, it's large-scale 3,000 points. I think those that embrace their army and don't fall apart when they're crutch level four or they're general or they miscast turn one and they die, I think the people that hold it together mentally and just keep going with the army and stick, stay the course of the strategy you practice, I think they're the ones that are going to come up on top. So. Mm. And like you were saying, we're uh, guaranteed if you're running a hell cannon, odds are at some point you're going to be uh, misfiring and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I really expect that for my own games as well, that out of one of the games, if I don't lose some of them out of stupidity, I'll have one game where animosity or stupidity or something like that bites me in the butt. But uh, we'll see. I mean, it should just be a, a bunch of fun. I still have high hopes you're going to be uh, the top Warriors of Chaos player, so we'll see. Uh, what we should do is find out whoever is your bad match. Uh, I'll just go against them. I'll just knock them out of your way, and we'll get you up there. So no, no. I, I think we should just get them. Drunk. Take it down from the inside. No, but I, I think we should just give them shots, lace the shots. Hey, there you go. Get them drunk if they're underage. Hey, no time better than the present to to break that barrier um, and, and cross that bridge. <laughs> It's possible. I mean, we had that free gaming the day before, right? So we just got to figure out who your opponents are and just, yeah, get them completely smashed. If one of them doesn't drink, I can seduce them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I mean, it should be lots of fun. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm sure you agree with me that even if we don't do well and we lose the majority of our games, the, the actual idea of the event of how big it's going to be is just going to be worth it alone. But... Yeah, I mean, I've never been to an event this big. I think the biggest fantasy tournament I've ever been to has been like 20 guys. Colonial GT in March was the biggest tournament I've ever been to. It's like 50 guys or so for 40K. So going to something with 80-plus people at it is going to be uh, fantastic. It's going to be great to meet some people. I was shocked when I went to Colonial, and a couple people came up to me and knew who I was. So anytime I get that, I'm incredibly humbled, and I really enjoy, you know, those experiences. So, and I, and I made a little this the print business card, so I can hand them out when people go, "What's your channel?" Because it's like eighteen letters long, and I can't find it. It's right on the card. So, yeah, actually, uh, for the longest time, because I just see your name in the comments there, I was like, "Oh, it's the uh, sustainability center, sustainability center." <laughs> and then when it came up for this, I was like, "Oh, damn!" I'm, I'm reading it wrong the entire time and I just had to really make sure I mean for the last one that got all lost that I actually okay don't say it wrong don't say it wrong so oh, it doesn't it, it doesn't but matter yeah, I, mean, I don't want to do myself and usually 
Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for my part, I mean, I'm not planning to make any uh, business cards or anything. But what I usually do is on my army list that I hand out, it says there that hey, if you want to see the battle report, I'll be on the YouTube under Mr. Malorian. But I mean, doing that with a business card, I mean, just gives that extra little, you know, pizzazz and all that fun stuff. So yeah, it's a it's a quality uh, of life thing. Do you do you plan to try to do battle reports? Because I don't think I'll be able to take the the number of pictures I need in the time that we have. Oh, I, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm hoping that over that weekend, I'm going to be doing eight battle reports because I have my game with one spit and one that is place. We have the the free gaming before where I'm hoping to get two or three games there. And then you have the five games of the tournament. So, I mean, I guess one thing that's really different with my army is that I just run it straight up aggressive. So, and I guess now that I have all these war machines, I'll be even just like sitting back, poo-poo, that's all I need to do. And then... But uh, yeah, I'm definitely just going to be trying to go for the the pictures there. Um, I mean, if it if it does turn out that between the way it's working, games is not working out. What I'll probably do is just take my pictures during my opponent's side of the the uh, turn, so that I mean, if it's my turn, it's go go go, and then I mean, go ahead and start your turn, and I'll take a picture. I mean, sure, your arm might be in there or something, but at least I have it. So I'm going to give it a try. I'm sure my yeah. camera will die or something like that, but yeah, I'm gonna have to. Now, now you set the bar. I have to do it now. I can't. I, I gotta put my money where my mouth is and do it. And uh, maybe I'll be able to pull a ticket and, and take a number and get a game with you. Uh, game with you Friday night because I know I'm not gonna be near the the luscious Malorian in the first place table. Um, but but maybe I can pull a ticket Friday night and uh, sneak a game in there and get you drunk so that way I can take your spot. Oh, <laughs> well, <laughs> did you did you see that one? Uh, Shot hammer video I put up there. I, yes, I did. So I, yeah. I I know you're a lush, and that 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 that's your <laughs> army's crutch. And uh, I don't know if I'll be able to expose it because when things go bad, one or two shots makes warriors feel so much better. Just yeah, whatever. Oh yeah. Frenzy, frenzy after <laughs> dogs. I don't really care. Yeah. Well, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we should try and get a game. I mean, man, if I could, I'd just be playing all the way through the night and everything. But, uh, yeah, I guess the next time I see you, will be actually there. So that should be tons of fun. So uh, thanks I mean, thanks so much for coming on here. Uh, of course, I'll have uh, a little link to your, your channel at the bottom there. And it isn't a small link. You, I'm in a small channel. You've got a lot of uh, subscribers now, and you put up a lot of content. So, uh, anyway, thank you for coming on. And uh, any last words or anything you wanted to say? No, it was, it was a pleasure to speak to you. I look forward to seeing you at Brawlers, and uh, you know, hopefully in a, in a few months we can circle back and do this again. Sounds good. And then uh, for the viewers there, I'll be doing this again next week, but actually on the Monday, and I'm doing it with my first-round opponent. So uh, we can talk some strategy and figure out how I'm going to lose uh, by massacre in the first game. So see you guys there. Bye.